through questions. And again, please, uh, please identify who you are, especially if you're with the press. I notice a couple of people are with the press. And then, um, not sermons, mm -hmm. quick comments, quick questions, so everybody gets a chance. And we will hold about 10 minutes, at maybe even 15 minutes at the end for um, the panel to respond. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Ni Akwete. Um, I have uh, a two-part question. The first one, the first part is for Asia, because when the IMF uh, needed a fund from Congress, I was also very surprised that the members did not um, listen to the idea that the IMF should accept some conditions especially changes in their thinking before they get this extra money. And so my question is, what is your reading of why these elected officials didn't feel it necessary to get the IMF to at least talk about what they have learned from the crisis before they get all this money? My other question is for the gentleman from the IMF. And actually, it's a follow-up of a question that in May I asked your managing director. And one of the things that he said to me when I said, you know, have you changed your thinking? Do you still think all deficits are bad things? And he said, well, you should know I don't think that because I'm a French socialist. And so Joe Marie's point is important to me because I didn't get a follow-up. But my question was not about what he believed personally, but I phrased it wrongly. So he escaped through that by saying, personally, I don't believe. So I want to ask you, the institution, does the IMF still believe two of the pillars of the Washington Consensus, which is that all deficits are bad and governments have no role in the economy and therefore they should be drowned? Have you, have you learned anything from the crisis? Do you still believe those two things? And I just want to say that I think Mark does great work, so thank you. Um, Nate, where are you? Um, I'm doing independent um, analysis and trying to get Africans more involved because I think, you know, the IMF has a long, and if you ask me, terrible record in Africa. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Nate. Okay, go ahead. We're going to take three questions and then the, the panelists will respond and then we'll do another batch. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Elaine Zuckerman of Gender Action. Um, I'm just seeking a small procedural clarification that I actually asked Mark on the street recently, and Asia alluded to this issue, um, and that is, um, after Congress approved $108 billion for the IMF, um, Obama prepared this bad signing statement, and following that, as you know, four congressional leaders wrote a letter to uh, the administration to Obama saying this is unacceptable and that uh, we won't ever allocate any more money to the IMF or World Bank if the signings, if, um, if the reforms are attached to the IMF. So whatever happened to that, did Obama ever respond to the uh, four leaders? Um, uh, again, Asia alluded to a negative outcome. How did that happen? Thank you. And one more. Yes, sir. Thanks. My name is Jose Cordero, and I'm an economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Um, um, I have a couple of comments on the uh, on this uh, presentation um, on the part of the of the IMF. Um, one of them is that eff effectively one of the arguments of the Zipper papers is that the IMF got it wrong when they made the, pro the projections of some growth on these on these countries. Uh, of course, we know that forecasts are risky, sometimes pretty inaccurate, uh, but it was clear at the time that the economy was going wrong, it was going bad, it was going down, uh, not only in the developing, na in, the, in the advanced nations, but also in the developing nations. So we believe that, uh, uh, I mean, once you believe that recommending the use of uh, uh, procyclical policies at the moment was inadequate, uh, was inadequate, it is clear that the IMF afterwards um, corrected the forecasts and also allowed for increased deficits. 
but it was only after the policies had been in place for a certain amount of time, which means that the policies had some time to have an effect, uh, not with the, the, I mean, the, the economic study with the IMF that you mentioned, the standard, I would have to look at the progression to see how they were, how they were made. But just uh, one, one, one more thing. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned at the, be at the beginning of on your presentation has to do with the fact that social protection is a key element of the programs. Yet, I have a newspaper clipping that, that I just got uh, from, from Latvia indicating in the newspaper clipping that Latvia has failed to deliver draconian spending cuts agreed to secure the next trench of the bailout from the European Union and the IMF, uh, including cuts in pensions and further cuts in public wages. That's only one country, but I ask, isn't that part of public spending? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, the briefer your answers, the more questions you get. So we're going to come down the table. Asia, Mark, James. I can be really brief. Um, uh, I think there are many reasons why uh, um, the Congress uh, was not as willing as we would have wanted them to have been in attaching some conditions um, to this massive appropriation. In part, it was because the president um, staked quite a lot of political capital in getting the appropriation through Congress. So there are a number of um, bad process points along the way in terms of how quickly it was, uh, it was moved and the way in which it was moved um, through the Senate and then actually through the House. Um, so uh, the, the president uh, placed a very high priority on delivering on this G20 commitment in London to, um, to committing uh, resources to the IMF and in uh, the, the uh, conceptualization of the White House, that meant not slowing down to uh, interrogate the conditions um, associated with this kind of investment. We don't see it as an either or um, uh, 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 equation. So that's a, that's a big concern. To Elaine's point about the signing statement, my understanding of where things were, um, were ended up, um, and someone in the audience or on the panel might have more, uh, uh, might have more up to date information, was that essentially the House um, condemned the signing statement, um, but it's in a way too little, too late. I mean, the, the, the signing statement was, was challenged and was criticized. Um, but they have the resources that they need. Um, so I, I, maybe someone has um, an assessment about where uh, an appropriate point is for enforcement of some of the ideas that came forward in that condemnation by the House um, and how um, it can actually be followed up in, in um, a clear way. Um, but that's my sense of what actually happened. Okay, thank you. Mark? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll respond to my colleagues will do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can talk in something. Two else. interesting <laughs> questions. Um, one is the um, the pro you know, uh, responses, uh, the, the ambiguity around this, um, and whether they do damage. There is a lot of time between the time that the fund signs an original standby arrangement, and then there's a review when they made their uh, changes. Um, so there is time for it to do that. I, you know, let me just give a comparison to the United States if people think this is just harmless. I mean, imagine, okay, they said we had our first stimulus in February of 2007. Now, imagine 2008 when the economy was already in recession. These screams that I mentioned, some of them were all 2008 after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. You know, the world economy was a mess. And imagine that we, which is acknowledged in the paper that uh, James cited, that we actually said, well, we can't really afford to let food stamps and unemployment and other automatic stabilizers go up as much as they would under current law. In other words, we have to change current law so as to reduce these benefits relative to what they're supposed to be by law. Now, of course, they would still go up, you know, because of the massive increase in demand for them but they wouldn't go up as much as they're supposed to. People, this wouldn't, no one could get away with this in the United States, okay? So when James shows that 14 out of 15 countries had increasing fiscal deficits, 
Yeah, they had increasing fiscal deficits because their economies collapsed, not because the government was taking a pro-cyclical stance. So uh, that's a very important thing to understand, that these measures would not be permitted in, in, a, in a country where there was enough democracy uh, to, to allow them to, to, to be prevented. Okay, James? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, uh, a few of these questions, I mean, uh, this question, um, do we, do we still think all deficits are bad and, and that governments have, have no role in the economy? This is, this is one of these questions like, uh, are you still beating your wife? <laughs> so, um, no. <laughs> you know, no, no uh, I don't think the fund has ever said that all, all deficits are bad or that the government should have no role. I mean, it, it, the, and the, the programs that we've just been talking about are showing exactly how the fund thinks that deficits are a very good idea right now. Um, the question is when is the, the, the right time to, to run a deficit and when is the right time to run a balanced budget and what, you know, this is all about fiscal sustainability and that's been at the centerpiece of, of all fund programs um, for, for a long time now. And it depends from country to country, it depends on debt levels, it depends on interest rate levels, it depends on, on, on lots of different country specific variables. And there's no you know, simple answer that some countries should also, always do something and some countries should always do something else. There's, there's, a cycle to be taken account of. We take a lot of uh, effort to try to understand what's happening to, to the cycle to, to, to understand. And clearly, now is a time when we want to see big expansions of deficits all, all, all around. Governments, uh, of course, governments have a role. I mean, governments are the ones uh, implementing these programs. We, we, we work with governments. That's what that's what we do. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't think that's only uh, only DSK speaking. That's uh, that, that's the fund. I mean, on, on that, I can I can also pick up your question at the beginning that um, this this idea that somehow there's one person that's sort of changing the fund and, and, and where the rest of us are kind of uh, not not uh, not with the program. I think I think that you know it un un underestimates uh, what's happened in this crisis. I mean, it's it, it's a major crisis. Uh, there's been a huge leadership role both by our management in the fund, but also a huge leadership role from, from the world. There's been a lot of coordinated effort from, from the G20, from other leaders to, uh, to respond to this crisis. And, and I think that you know, th those are all taken into account. And, and you know, I would say that the fund staff you know, have, have a role in that. We're not sort of trying to uh, push back all the time on, on people on, on, on what the leadership is trying to get us to do. I think there's, there's really a lot of uh, uh, imagination and effort from, from the fund staff to, to rise to these, these challenges. So I just wanted to, to try to respond to, to that kind of idea. Um, on, on the on the um, on the question about about procyclicality, I mean, I, I talked here about procyclicality in the terms that, that uh, the CDPR paper talked about it. So I was trying to explain on that. Now, in, in our paper, we do go into a lot more detail about what's automatic stabilizers and what's not. Um, and, and so I, you know, just encourage you to to look at that um, because, of course, you're right. I mean, a, a lot of the expansion in the deficits is, is automatic stabilizers. As far as the, the um, uh, emerging market countries go, it's, it's, it, on average, it's pretty much all of it. Um, in, in fact, there is a little, some, some pushback. It's, it's not so much on the expenditure side in emerging markets. I mean, the main automatic stabilizer we see in the emerging market side is, is, on, is, on, uh, is on revenues. And revenues have really you know, collapsed, as, as, as you say, in these, these countries. And that's, why the deficits have expanded. Uh, in some cases, uh, we've, the, the programs have gone further than that, and there's been real expenditure increases uh, in a lot of, on top of the revenue declines. In a lot of cases, they've, they've gone less far, and the implications of automatic stabilizers running completely uh, are too risky from a debt point of view, that there would be too big an expansion. I mean, there's a limit to how, how big a deficit can be, and I showed you these you know, quite large numbers, Latvia, uh, 14 percent, or, or whatever it was, Ukraine, 9 percent. You know, so there's some very big deficits out there, and uh, they're really, you know, it is not. Uh, I don't think anybody would say that it's advisable to uh, just throw all caution to the winds and, and, and just throw uh, throw massive fiscal deficits in, into there. We, you know, the fund is providing a lot of financing, including financing directly to budgets, in order to meet uh, to, to allow expanded deficits. But there, there, there has to be a limit based on. on Financing based on uh, debt issues and based on sustainability, uh, and that's what I mean. In, in the paper, we try to identify, you know, where those limits are and whether they're being set set properly. And I, I think, you know, we, we 
we argue that they, they are being set appropriately. Okay, thank you. Okay, next round. This analysis question. shows that there's no statistical, statistically significant difference between these two countries or these two groups of countries. Huh? Now, isn't this setting the bar rather low for what an IMF agreement should accomplish? And uh, second, in that light, um, this one's for Mark, uh, what would be a more appropriate role for an expanded IMF to deal with crisis situations? Thank you. Okay, one more question. There's a B. Edwards. Yeah, I'll be in your next round. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to um, reiterate the question that was asked earlier of James, which is um, you said that the social protection programs were a key element of these standby arrangements. And what did you mean by that? What are those programs consistent? Okay, go ahead. Uh, my name is Robert Weissman, public citizen. I have a question, James. That's a legitimate question, it's not a question of an argument. <laughs> um, the you know the big chunk of the of the conditionality focused on the financial sector. I'm really very curious to to know the funds thinking going forward now. Um, what kind of framework have you had in mind for the financial sector? If, do you think it's fair to say that there was a real orientation toward the liberalization of the past in a, in a in a larger financial sector? Do you see that shifting going forward? Okay, thank you. Asia, do you want to respond to any of this? Yeah, just to comment, uh, because it, it, it came up earlier, and um, you know, this, this issue about uh, social protection featuring in some of the SBAs, um, I think it's important um, to dig into that a little bit, in particular, the extent to which uh, investment, so a commitment to investment in social protection, that's important. But, there's uh, serious concerns about um, what's possible in terms of expanding social protection in an environment where overall the uh, lending to the country um, is not counter-cyclical. So, um, so I just think it's, it's again, it's, it's valuable that the IMF recognizes that social protection um, is important at a time of economic crisis, but uh, there's a question of um, scale and, and scope and and whether um, that's consistent with um, with uh, pro-cyclical policies in the same countries. Um, uh, yeah, that was just one point I wanted to come in. Okay, Mark. Yeah, this is in response to Juan's question first. On the, yeah, I do think that regression does set too low of a bar. I mean. The, uh, the program countries should have done better. The other countries didn't have access to IMF resources. So, you know, unless you can show, obviously you can't do that much with one regression, but I mean, unless, um, you know, a simple uh, or a scatter plot, you know, then, but, you know, obviously you come back and say, well, the program countries are in worse shape, but it's not that clear. I mean, a lot of countries stayed away, you know, everybody can stay away from the IMF does. I mean, that's, a that's just a fact. And so, um, the, you know, so th they didn't do any worse. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as, as something to write home about, uh, even if it's true. Um, you'd be loaning them money so, supposedly so they can be better in a crisis than, than somebody who doesn't borrow. Um, again, you know, you could argue about that. The, the other thing, though, is what, you know, should the IMF do? I, I really think that we are setting too low a bar here everywhere. I mean, so, you know, and I guess James made a good case that we used too, uh, we used too generous of a category for pro-cyclical in our evaluation. He says, well, he's just using ours. Did the deficit expand? Well, okay, so if the deficit expands solely because the economy is collapsing, you know, and because, and partly in some cases because it's collapsing because you have pro-cyclical policies, you know, uh, and, and then you're gonna call that not pro-cyclical. Well, we gave that to them in a lot of cases, but really we shouldn't. You know, I just want to, you know, you want a simple, what, what should the IMF do? Do what the rich country, you know, your policies in the poor countries should be with the rich countries, unless it's really not possible, okay? But uh, in many of these cases, in most of these cases, it is. You know, so we wouldn't accept this in, in, the, in the United States. We wouldn't accept cutting, you know, making uh, cuts in social programs or any kind of uh, public spending at a, at, a, at a time of recession. The state governments actually do that here, right? That's why we, that's one of the things that really weakened our stimulus here, is the state governments are doing what the IMF prescribes 
uh, elsewhere. They're they're reducing the uh, pro-cyclical, uh, sorry, sorry, they're reducing the counter-cyclical measures that are built in automatically into into the budget because they're trying to come closer to balancing their budget. And and the federal government should be doing the opposite. So that's what the IMF should be promoting in the other countries. I just want people to understand that you know. Jane presented a very different uh, analysis than we have, but they're compatible. I read both of those papers. They are, they are definitely, their, their data is the same as ours. What they're doing is two different things. One is, you know, they're, they're not, they're ignoring all the pro-cyclical policies prescribed in 2008 that were later reversed. I don't see how, you, why you would give that, you know, why you would say that that doesn't matter. And, and, and two, they're counting these cases where the you know the the deficit eventually you know the deficit eventually expanded because of the collapse of, of revenues as uh, pro cyclical. And finally, the other thing that they you know they have to do better. You, you can't you know okay the consensus forecasts were wrong, all right. So the IMF did was also wrong. But I don't find that as an excuse. Okay, it, you know it isn't just random. Like it isn't just okay you know. You have a distribution. Some forecasters turn out to be right. You know they're on the margins, like Rubini and Seeper. Okay, no, you know we were not right because you know we just happen to be right because we're always predicting gloom and doom. That we're not actually okay. We had a, a very clear analysis of a housing bubble that was painfully obvious as early as 2002, and and my colleague Dean Baker tracked the size of it all the way till it burst. Began, it peaked in 2006 and burst in, in continuing to 2007, and that's $8 trillion. And the wealth effect, as you know, is enough to send this economy into a very serious recession. In fact, it's worse than we've had since the Great Depression. So the IMF should be able to understand that when it's presented to them. They can't come up with it by themselves. They should at least be able to understand it when it's presented to them. Okay, and you know, I'll give you credit. You had four pages in the latest World Economic Outlook on, on the latest one now, okay, uh, on housing bubbles. But you should have caught up with us a long time ago, and you wouldn't have had such terrible forecast. And you know, I'm not just bragging about Seeper. I mean, just it just so happens that a lot of economists, most economists, really miss this. But that's a terrible indictment of the profession, and the, and the, and the fund can't escape that by just saying everybody else was wrong. Okay, so they're going to have to do better on their forecasts. Okay, James. Okay. Um, Sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, come back earlier on the on the social uh, the social protection. I mean, we have a section in, in the paper on this, and, and uh, I mean, although a lot of these countries are um, facing very severe fiscal problems uh, because of because of the uh, collapses in revenues they're seeing, the programs you know did involve uh, in protection of social spending within within the projections made in the programs within within the commitments made by the authorities in in, in the programs. Um, there was space. For social spend, spending to be to be protected, I mean one of one of the key issues has also been to try to find better targeting of, of social spending because in a lot of these countries they have still inherited uh, you know very um, uh, general uh, systems of, of social protection which are too generous to a lot of people and, and don't actually protect the, the most vulnerable uh, and so there's you know there's there's efforts in that in that direction there's been ongoing efforts in that direction the problem is it's very hard to Make these kind of changes quickly. This is something that you know you need the World Bank and others to come in and, and over a, over a period to do. So um, I, I don't know how effective you know in, increased targeting can, can be, but there have uh, you, I mean I just encourage you to look at the, the section in the paper. We have a chart showing showing that social spending, real real social spending, has uh, increased in all but three of the of the emerging market cases, and, and I think um, uh, you know that can can confirm that we also have the same the same story in, in the links where in fact I think there's actually specific conditions in some in some cases on, on social spending. Um, should we uh, is it too low a bar? I mean this is a this is a tricky question. You know, should the IMF countries have done better than the comparable countries? I I find that you know a little bit hard to expect. Um, you think about the countries as, as Mark said, the countries, you know, they don't come voluntarily usually to the fund. They come because they face a financing constraint, a severe financing constraint, and I would find it hard to expect that they, they would do much, you know, on average, taking account of their, their initial conditions, that they would do much better. I think, you know, I think it, it is quite a strong result that they, they didn't do worse. Uh, 
I, I stress this because Mark specifically said they did do worse uh, than, than the other uh, because of the fund programs. And I, think I actually did, never said that. In your intervention you did. I don't know if you, uh, no, you did in the so. paper. But, um, so, uh, worse, than they done. worse than they would have done. I think, I mean, the fact that they're doing as well as ones that didn't come, uh, I think it's evidence that they're doing a lot better than they, they, they would have done uh, without the, the financing from the fund. Um, quickly, um, on, on, on the, the forecasting, I mean, just one point I wanted to make, that the fund, uh, of course, you know, like to say with, with everybody else, the fund was, was, did have two rosy forecasts in early 2008, for example. But in, in terms of the policies that the fund was, was uh, proposing then, the fund, I think the fund was well out ahead in early 2008 in, in calling for a global fiscal stimulus based on the risk that we saw to the, to the global economy. And I think it was very important that the fund was doing that and, and that, that, that that call was, was heard around the place. So I think, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the actual actions taken in order to, to on, on policies because of our concerns about vulnerable workers, I think the record is, 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 quite, is quite good at that, at that point. Okay, last round of questions. Yes, we'll take um, four questions. I'm Susan Lowe from the New School of Research and Research. Um, just on rosy forecasts, I just want to say there is an IEO study from 2003 that finds exactly the same thing, that there are systemic optimistic projections for both investment and for growth um, in IMF programs. And it's something that's been picked up by non-IMF related researchers. But um, specifically, that was 2003. So this is something that you guys have known about for a long time. Clearly, it should be adjusted for in your models. I wanted to know what adjustments, what adjustments have been made in your assumptions. Um, the next question really has to do with the scale of deficits that are allowed, because we've talked about how great it is that we've allowed these deficits to you know, exist, even though they're kind of difficult to avoid, obviously. Um, but the question is really, um, do we see the IMF in the kind of Keynesian way that the IMF as, which is providing a role that these central banks cannot provide and these government, governments cannot provide otherwise. Um, and the real limitation would seem to me to be what are the reserves of the IMF? And I just did a back of envelope estimation based on what you guys have in gold reserves, and it's about $824 billion um, at market prices, kind of recent market prices. So clearly you guys can, to my mind, you guys can allow a lot more um, the World Bank has estimated an 11.6 billion shortfall in core spending for the poorest countries, and clearly that can be met by what you have in reserves. So I'm wondering what models you use, this is the specific question, what models do you use to identify what is the absolute maximum deficit that a country can run? Okay, here you go. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Tamara Gaw with TransAfrica Forum, and I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on James' um, point that um, sometimes social spending is too generous. And um, I think my follow-up question is, um, in your mind, who makes that decision? Um, because I think uh, that there's a, uh, a qualitative and quantitative difference in people's perception of what you know, sitting on high might be an elevated level of social spending and what might actually be a more practical determination on the ground. So I just wanted you to kind of elaborate on your point on that. Okay. Yes. My name is Becky Ray, I'm also with Cooper, and I wanted to move the conversation to monetary policy a little bit, because fiscal policy, I think, is very easy to wrap our brains around because we have public debates about fiscal policy all the time here. Uh, we've seen very high interest rates even in, in that chart, which obviously might help contain capital flight during a world recession, which is a valid concern, might also make recession much worse. And I wanted to talk about capital controls, or talk about, you know, you said we're setting the bar too low in general. Well, let's. Let's talk about what's possible. What, what other things could we be doing to prevent capital flight during a world recession uh, that might not lead to a worse recession? Uh, you, Rob, have mentioned capital controls, and I'd, I'd love to hear you talk more about what you could envision uh, a new role for the IMF including in capital controls and, and other methods. Okay, and the chair recognizes herself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. One is, um, when you, Okay, James said, when it's too risky, when people, um, it's too risky to spend more on health and education, it's just too risky. 
risky. And well, too risky to have additional expenditures or to have a, a, a deeper deficit. And when is it really not possible, according to Mark, when is it really possible to let people die of common illnesses and hunger? When is it not possible to expand expenditures? I mean, I just, I can't, I don't understand that. It's, I mean, which people are expendable? And I was actually, oh, I'll skip that story. Anyhow, um, <laughs> the other question I have is that, I mean, we can challenge CEPR's work, you know, and you do and we do and everybody does, and that's fair. But, you know, in the end, CEPR is one of a large number of think tanks. There's only one IMF. When it comes to IMF evaluation, the IMF evaluates itself. The World, um, the Independent Evaluation Office has not been evaluating <coughs> programs, you know, specific programs. It does these great themes, two or three studies a year. But when I was reading one of the studies, I think it was on the low-income countries, as a good academic, you know, I looked at footnotes and I looked at the bibliography. Every citation was IMF. I'm sorry, I would have flunked the student. <laughs> I really would have. This is not legitimate evaluation. And you can't expect fund staff to be impartial evaluators of their own work or of their colleagues' work or their institution's work. And likewise, when governments are asked, and this is a study that Oxfam did with Debt Relief International, they did a comparable study to what Mark did, or a parallel study, and that is uh, when the IMF goes and asks governments, well, how do you think we're doing? And the finance minister says, <coughs> gee, great. Because A, the finance minister wants more money, and or B, he or she, rarely, uh, wants a job in the IMF. So, you know, this credibility of evaluation is extremely important, and I think it, there's a relatively simple approach to have the IEO do it. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with the IEO, and I think it does have the independence to do the evaluation. It just has to. We have to go over and lobby the IEO and say, sit down, guys, we need to talk about this. And they could do it. But right now, what's done isn't credible. Even if it's perfect research, you know, there's, there's the smell test. Um, I mean, it may be flawless. Um, with that, I turn it over to, I guess, Asia, your last shot before you do your final summation. <laughs> so just coming back to this issue and, and to a point raised by Tamara, but also um, it, it, it came up um, in, in um, the last round of comments about social protection. Um, the IMF sort of bringing in other actors and helping plan social protection schemes in countries. I think civil society has major concerns and questions about the World Bank's uh, credibility, track record, expertise in being able to perform that sort of targeting function. So. It's, it's really educational for me to hear that, that, that there might be a monopoly, on, that it's thought to be that there's a monopoly on, 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 that, on that important, you know, critical area of expertise. And, and I would uh, argue that you know, it's, a, it's a very important place for countries to look to multiple actors in terms of, of guidance and planning something as critical as the social safety net for the country, um, not just reflexively going to the bank. Um, um, then, uh, if, in response to the first point about um, about forecasting, uh, you know, I mean, one clear issue that's come out of Istanbul, it's come out of Pittsburgh, is the opportunity for the IMF to, to have an even more um, uh, dominant role as as the world's banker. And I think if they missed um, this financial crisis, then there would be a, a massive concern in, um, or a, a, a large uh, a question a, a mark over whether or not um, they have the, the expertise and whether it's appropriate for them to, to take on that role moving forward. Um, um, I think, um, you know, in, in particular, um, uh, Joe Marie, you brought up 
this point of when it's acceptable to, um, to for countries not to expand um, their investments in priority sectors like healthcare, like education. I mean, I think what we can all agree is that, or, well, coming from civil society, we can agree is that countries need um, more support in, in planning for more expansionary uh, uh, investments in, um, in health and education. And I think the issue is if, if the IMF is not supportive in, in countries making those sorts of, of predictions um, and, and, and going through those budgeting processes, then whose role is it? Because that's going to be even more critical. It's critical now in the midst of a global recession, um, but it's going to be uh, even more critical moving forward. So who can play that role if, in fact, um, the IMF has not uh, been able to, to take that on? Mark? Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll let Rob respond to the capital controls thing. Um, I, I do think there are obviously other policies. You know, when, when, when James says, well, you know, we haven't had a financial crisis, we, avoid, uh, uh, we, we avoided uh, what did he say? financial collapse. What, what was the word? Banking, banking crisis. Banking crisis. Well, it's not over yet. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, look at Latvia and, and, and Hungary, for example. I mean, they've got some uh, very serious uh, balance sheet problems, especially if there's if the if the currency does collapse in Latvia, which is you know, a real possibility, and and, and so and, and in the case of Latvia, okay, you save the banks, but at the expense of 18 percent of GDP, I would have rather had the banks go under and have a bailout like we had here, even, uh, um, and uh, you know take maybe a hit of two or three percent of GDP, um, and have some banks lose money in the Western European European banks that you know are loan there in Europe. They would lose money, and uh, and I think that's uh, something you have to consider is, is you know whose interests you're looking out for. When you talk about social protection, also uh, in Pakistan, you had an increase in the IMF program of 0.3 percent of GDP of uh, of social spending. Well, I don't think that makes up for the pro-cyclical policies there. Probably more people are going to be hurt by the uh, the budget cuts, the contraction of the economy, and the and again, um, when we get to this issue of what's possible, you know, what can they do? Um, you know, in a lot of these countries, everything is probably, you know, you're talking about really small amounts of money. In poor countries, it means almost nothing compared to the, you know, the, the trillion dollars of resources that the IMF is trying to get, I mean, getting close to from the, the rich countries. So uh, we're really talking about nothing. I think Asia mentioned the figure for the, the maintained uh, spending for the lowest income countries, you know, was 11 billion or so. 11, you know, it's very, I think it's even less than that. And, um, you know, so you have that. And then you have countries like Ukraine where, you know, you say you have to cut, you know, tighten fiscal policy uh, there. And the whole debt is only 10 point, the public debt is 10.6% of GDP. That's a very low public debt. So clearly they have, they have to borrow for a couple of years quite a bit to maintain any uh, spending levels. So again, I don't think the criteria are, are reasonable, and I think the problem is that the IMF never really has to justify it. You know, they just say, um, well, you know, here, this is too much, or, you know, you have to cut uh, this, or you have to tighten monetary policy, um, which, sorry, I think we didn't really uh, get to that either. But that's, a, that's another big, you know, actually, we shouldn't have really left that out, because a lot of these uh, tightening of monetary policy, which we listed, was taking place at a time when uh, prices were falling in the world, and uh, and the threat of inflation was diminishing. So uh, there's really not much of an excuse for that either. So again, um, I don't say that you know anything goes, and the IMF can afford to throw uh, you know billions of dollars at governments that are completely irresponsible and are never going to be able to pay it back. Um, you know, in, in the case of the middle. But you know, Joe Marie's point is a very good one for the, especially the poorest countries who need so little money, and they've gotten so little out of this expansion of the IMF spending. I mean, you know, as Asia pointed out, they can't really afford to borrow even at the low interest rates on the SDR expansion, so they can't really add to their debt. So what are they going to do? Well, I think in a time like that, they should, the, the IMF uh, and uh, should, should be able to should should be. Uh, 
willing, uh, you know, should be willing to consider grants. People have proposed that before as well for low-income countries, grants instead of loans. So, uh, um, and, and that should be obviously the other lending institution as well, like the World Bank, instead of adding to debt. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, that are just not really considered. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go to James next, and then, uh, because we are all but out of time, Rob, when you make your statement about capital count liberalization or controls or whatever you want to say, <laughs> that's, that's the closing of the envelope, okay? So James, your last statement. I feel like a talk show host. <laughs> Game show. I'm trying to pick up, pick up uh, as many of these points as I can. Um, on, on forecasting, um, you know, this question of whether, whether we, we favor um, program countries, I mean, within a program, it is a it is a the authorities program again. I can't stress that enough. You know we are we are supporting the authorities program. Um, we build you know and we have to agree with them on what what the program looks like. Um, and part of that is what the uh, projections look like. And I don't think we can uh, go completely you know off 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 the reservation there. I mean we can't be completely um, different from what what everybody thinks it's going to happen, and, and I mean, uh, so I, as I say, I, I don't, um, I don't, I, 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 I think we are trying to improve our forecasting, and I think there's a lot of ways we can look at improving our forecasting, and we are doing it with early warnings and financial sector vulnerabilities and things like that. I'm not sure we're ever going to get that good at it. I, that's why I stress the importance of adapting policies, that we're ready to change policies, uh, when, see changes in policies when, when, they're, when they're needed. I think that's what we've, we've proven in this in this crisis that we, we are ready to do with these very dramatic changes in in, uh, in economic circumstances. Um, is there a limit to uh, how much the deficit can go up? I mean, here we heard a lot about debt at the beginning. People concerned about increase in debt that we're building up a new debt problem. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a balance, right? I mean, now grants may be one way to, to meet that challenge of but more uh, government spending uh, without building debt. Uh, but the IMF, you know, now is a, a lender, and, and that's that's what we do. And so when we uh, look at um, the what's sustainable, uh, what's a sustainable deficit, uh, we're looking at sustainability from a debt point of view, and that's what we, we have to do, and we do it across all our, our programs. As I said, I, I think you know we try to get the best grants we can, and, and we we often have large expansionary policies, which are, which is what. what um, on social spending, I mean, we are not, uh, I think the point I was, I was making is we, we're not the experts. It's not that, you know, only the World Bank or, or only anybody else is the experts on this. It, it's, it's something that, that the fund uh, understands the importance of and stresses the importance of in, in our discussions with, with authorities. But we, we, we are not able to design these things ourselves. I mean, it's something the countries have to do uh, with whatever advisors and partners they, they want to do. Um, are there, are there some systems that are too generous? Again, I mean, I'm not the expert. I, I spent some time in Bulgaria, and I think if you look at any of these uh, emerging uh, Europe countries, you will find systems that, that are widely regarded as being badly targeted, and that there's a lot of scope for improving targeting. But uh, um, that, that was really what I was, was referring to there, that with the same amount of, uh, of resources, uh, there can be ways to find, to protect the most vulnerable people more effectively than the initial ways of doing it. And I think a lot of countries are taking you know, important steps in, in that direction. Um, capital controls, um, I meant to mention earlier because it came up at the beginning, and I think it's a very interesting topic and an interesting issue, and I, I, I just want to confirm that the fund is not, you know, completely against capital controls in, in every circumstance in, in any way, and indeed in these programs, you know, some of them have capital controls, notably Iceland uh, has extensive capital controls. It had more extensive ones at the beginning, but it still has a lot, and they are, you know, the authorities are intending to lift them, and, and within the program, there's a plan to, to, to lift them eventually, but they're there in the program. Uh, Latvia um, has, has had a, a deposit freeze on one of the main banks, partial deposit freeze. Uh, Ukraine and Pakistan have both had uh, capital controls that were lifted within the context of the program. And it really, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a question uh, of, of, you know, what, what's gonna work best in these, in these cases. And, and uh, you know, we, I don't think, we're, we're certainly not saying they should never, never, never exist. Um, often, country authorities again, you know, do not want to, to, to take them, and, and, and it, it's, a, it's a decision for, for them in the end. 
um, uh, on um, on the banking crisis. Uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't I couldn't agree with more with what uh, what Mark said uh, so far, uh, and I should have said that in the paper we do stress this a lot. So far, there have not been a lot of banking crises. We do see uh, a lot of um, you know potential credit problems may build up in in, in banks. Um, we see NPLs, non-performing loans, rising, uh, and I think there is there is a risk of further further problems down the road. Uh, it, there's a lot in in the programs agreed with the, the authorities to try to address these things with. Uh, bank uh, restructuring, debt restructuring initiatives, um, uh, recapitalization and things like that. But I, I think it's, some of those are not moving forward very fast and I think it's very important that they, that they do. Um, so I, I, I certainly agree, agree with that. Um, so uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, did you want to speak to the financial sector question? Speak to the, what you said. Well, how will it change? How will regulation? How it's changing? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a massive question which is, which is sort of beyond um, but Give us a paper to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's sort of being thought about. I think I don't I don't think um, you know I think there's a recognition around the world that that uh, things have to be done on regulation and there's a lot of efforts um, in, in a lot of fora on that, including and the, the IMF will you know will, will be playing a role in that. Uh, I, I can't quite say you know where it's going to go, but I think uh, I think it's a very live issue that's being debated very hotly inside and outside the. My name is Yudo Miyan from, uh, from the MF as well. Um, I'm speaking on for low income countries' cases on uh, financial market uh, issues. Um, in a lot of those low income kind of countries, you know, we focus on how to reduce interest rates, how to re remove barriers to credit uh, expansion to the private sector, how to promote credit expansion, expansion to the private sector as well. Now, we not only focus on liberalizing the financial sector, where it's probably we do recommend, but a lot of focus in low income countries on how to improve efficiency of the market. We know a lot of farmers do not get credit, a lot of small enterprises do not get uh, credit. And that is where we focus a lot of our attention. I'd like to make a comment on social uh, spending. Um, uh, I think Asia mentioned that express concern how to expand social spending when you have a contractory uh, fiscal policy. And then as James showed that you know uh, the program has adapted not always have contractory, uh, contractory policy. On top of that, uh, for low income countries where uh, I work, uh, the MF put a lot of emphasis on the increase of social spending. Uh, that's why you look on the slide which shows that 16 out of 19 countries programs have increased social spending in real terms when, have a, when we have a major decline in revenue. And that's, to me, quite remarkable. Right? And uh, of course, we're all concerned about people's health. But there has to be a, a, you know, a balance. What's the priority? A lot of countries put priority on health education. We support it. A lot of countries want to also invest in infrastructure. So there has to be some balance. And we support authorities to figure out their own priorities. That's, I think that's the key. Um, I'll stop here. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, go ahead, Ralph. I'll try not to cheat too much. <laughs> I have the last slide. Um, and uh, let me just thank you all for, for, uh, for turning out, and especially for, to James for really responding seriously, trying to go through all this and, and doing it with, with good humor. I, I think it is a good conversation. Hopefully. Uh, let me just sort of touch on Becky's uh, comment, and, and sort of maybe particularly on the capital controls, but also on a, a broader frame, which is what I was trying to highlight at the outset. Um, in a sense, we're off topic from the conversation, which really was on looking you know, in a really focused way on what's happened during the crisis period. But the thing most important going forward is going to be not the crisis period, but how we how the world responds. Maybe a takeoff point what, is what Joe Marie said, which is sort of you know, it's always a little bit out of place in the conversation about economic policy. What's this is sort of the outrage about the utterly immoral tolerance for avoidable suffering that's pervasive. And as, as, as Asia 
points out, is actually pretty cheap in Cura. Okay. That is a frame that we have to bring into the conversation. Um, we have to find ways to, to address it both directly, but also just for translate it into what we're thinking about the big picture we get on the policy stuff. Um, it can't just be an add-on, it can't be an attachment, it has to, what's the point of having the economy if we can't keep people fed, give them decent health care, right? How is them? That is the point of the economy. Uh, and you get on the policy. It has to be to deliver those things. Um, at the same time, you can't just sort of say, you've got to do it. You've got to sort of figure out how to translate into economic policy. And with you know, respect for that, that's, there's no question that's underlying what people like at, at the fund are trying to do. They view it as an objective, but I think you know, not always are always satisfactory. Because again, you might say, well, we just can't, we can't do it right now. That, 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 that can't be the answer. The answer has to be we can do it. How do we figure it out? I happen to think the capital controls are an important part of the answer. One reason I think they're an important part of the answer is the point that James was making between the debt and the deficit issue. Let me come back to that in a second. Just clarify where I understand the fund is on capital controls. And I'm a little dated because I haven't seen the stuff that I haven't looked in the last couple of months. There was a not long ago an affirmative opposition to capital controls, actually a move at the fund to put into its sort of core mission liberalization of capital accounts. Um, the review after the Asian financial crisis was that countries did pretty well, did better for imposing capital controls than those that didn't. Uh, that institutional sort of uh, mandatory policy or bias against capital controls was abandoned. The stuff that the, the fund put out, I think, in the spring of this year, around a meeting in Tanzania, said, look, yes, it's true, countries did better in the financial crisis adopted capital controls, they may be appropriate in some cases. We were pretty skeptical. We are especially skeptical for poor countries. Um, I think that's a mistake, but it wasn't. So I think to overcome the, the long-standing uh, sort of market liberalization, it has to be an affirmative embrace about them and the exploration of where they're appropriate, not just for middle-income countries or, or, or rich countries. Uh, the reason I think that they're important is that countries with unused resources, which is every single poor country on the planet, and now even rich countries like the United States with massive unemployment, the resource of people not being put to work, have to figure out how to mobilize their own resources domestically. Um, there's a problem if you've got this bleeding out of all the money. If, you've got, if you're relying on foreign investment, you, you're going to see it bleeding out. You can solve that to some extent if you impose capital controls in creative ways and then figure out how to mobilize your domestic resources. To me, that's a frame that we've got to think about much more. All the we are engaged in sort of economic policy making at the fund and outside and so on. Uh, I think part of thinking about that is what are a different set of what are a different set of, of measures and objectives and, and policies and ways to count things, which is what I was trying to hint at in the opening uh, questions. So, you know, there's a lot of inflation targeting. Why don't we have unemployment targeting? What, how, how about thinking about is a way to address the Joe Marie question about unmet social need? doing expanded healthcare investments, treating them as an investment that are not part of the, uh, the budget. Uh, so off budget accounting for that. Not sort of you know, throwing money to the wind, but treating it as an investment. And especially in infrastructure, where there's a much more thinking about this. It's what, it's what, it's what uh, companies do anyway, and it's what we're thinking, you know, what we're thinking about more in the United States. I think it's, there's more role for that in developing countries. So I think those are a set of things that are among many others that should be much more on the table and I hope will be part of the conversations that we have uh, going forward, these, these kind of particular conversations that also sort of broader policy conversations. And uh, you know, there's going to be time now for people to mingle. Uh, those of us are going to have to run off into the rain. But thank you all for coming out, and we look forward to more conversations.